Hey everyone, welcome to Lexington Park Baptist Church where God is on the move. Hallelujah. So glad you've joined us here for worship today. Let's get our worship on. Take it away, gentle Ben.
Good morning, family of God. It's so good to be with you here in worship. I'm glad you joined us here. We are now into October. It's hard to believe, but fall is now among us. So as we move into our fall, I have a few announcements I want to share with you. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are just grateful to be together as houses of worship, continuing to worship you through digital worship, continuing to sustain our worship, continuing to exalt you and praise you and glorify your name. God, thank you that we continue to advance our operations and our ministries and our missions, all for your glory. Now today, God, we pray that you will be with us in worship. We'll be glorified in all that we say and all that we do. And God, may we be lifted up. May we be strengthened. May we be encouraged as we continue to realize we're stronger together. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, the few announcements I got for you is first, as we enter into October, there's a lot going on. First of all, don't forget about our annual business meeting. October 14th is the Zoom Q&A. Be looking for a link. Be looking for information. It should be coming out to you. And you can join us for a Q&A on the 14th at 6 p.m. Then on the 21st, October 21st, we will have our annual business meeting right here in the sanctuary. We'll be here. We'll social distance. We'll mask up. We'll get through our meeting. We're going to keep it as short as possible, but we're going to come together, and we're going to vote on the things we need to vote on. So all discussion and questions on the 14th, and we come in together to have our quorum and do our vote on the 21st of October. Hope you can be here. We're also still working on a Zoom option that we can so you can watch watch if you can't make it, but remember, we have to have a quorum, so I need some of you to show up so we can ha- hold our annual meeting. So I hope you'll be here. Also during October at the end of the month, October 25th, we're going to start on mo- we're going to start on Sunday nights. We're going to start to have our comeback workshops, the 25th of October, then we'll move the 8th of November, and then the 22nd of November. There'll be three workshops, 6 to 8 p.m., that we'll be having to conduct to figure out how we're going to come back and come back stronger with the Lord. Um, And then lastly, I wanted to remind you at the end of the month, October 30th, is our trunk or treat. We need you to sign up. We need you to volunteer. We need you to be willing to come and decorate your car. And we'll space the cars out in the parking lot and kids can come through and we can give out candy and we can minister. We can pass out tracts. We're going to have a registration table and we're going to have some Frisbees to give out with the gospel message. So we've got some stuff to go out to people. So please be a part of Truck or Treat if you can. Let's have fun. We also need people to volunteer to cook the hot dogs and serve the hot dogs. So we're not going to be inside like we do for our our, normally for our, our our fall festival, but we will be having a trunk or treat on October 30th. Please volunteer. Hey, that's all I've got for right now. There's a lot more going on. Make sure you check your calendar. Make sure you check your communicator. Make sure you check your illuminator. And remember, God is on the move.
down, it is rising down all around this sea and the love the Lord is ring down, it is rising down.
that the shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome your name is alive forever lifted high your name cannot be overcome Good morning, everybody. It is giving time. I am just so grateful to come to you with good news that God wants to lavish upon you all the riches of Christ Jesus. Did you know that he wants you to be rich? He wants you to be rich in Christ. We don't think about that in time of giving, but he says he's supposed to be rich in his grace, immeasurable grace. God pours out upon us. He wants to lavish his grace upon us. So as he does that, we should want to respond back to him and give back to the Lord. So I just want to encourage you, as God has blessed you, may you bless back to the Lord. May you give back a portion of all that he's given you. The Bible tells us to give a tithe, to give a tenth, but also to bring our offerings. It also tells us, listen, everything belongs to the Lord. So as we know that God has richly blessed us in Christ, may we richly bless him back with the things he's given us in advancing his kingdom through the ministries of the church. Let's continue to pray for our operations, continue to pray for our ministries, and continue to pray for our mission efforts. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you and we give back a portion to you, God, may you take it, may it exceed anything we could ever imagine. May you multiply these gifts to expand your kingdom. Father God, may we know that you've called us to be givers and that, Lord, that you have lavished every rich gift of Christ and grace and mercy and love upon us. And out of that gratefulness for what you've given us and you've made us rich, may we now give back to you and your efforts and your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, trusting you, God, with all of our hearts. God, we know that you are the stability that our lives need and that we need to build our lives upon your steadfast love, oh God. We pray, God, for all of God's people that we will build our lives upon the solid rock of Christ, upon your word and upon your love. God, we know that anybody that builds their house upon the rock, that even though the storms may come, the winds may rage and the rains may fall, that that house will, will survive and will stand. So God, may we place our trust in you. And may you be our solid rock in these uncertain times in which we now live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Chris. We need to have a special announcement for a special called business meeting that we are announced this past week, October 1st. You should have received an email from Mary, the church clerk, who gave you all the documents for the annual report and for the annual business meeting that contains a bylaw change for Section 3 on the leadership portion of our bylaws. By our bylaws, uh, Will Clark, the trustee, has sent you a letter through me uh, the, past, the past Tuesday and it is telling you that this Wednesday coming up, we will have a special called Zoom Business Meeting. That's October the 7th at 6 p.m. The Zoom link is contained on the email, and you can see it on the link below. Greg Mabry will put it up there for you. So please, if you don't have that link, please either see me or Will Clark or contact Greg Mabry. And we will see you at 6 p.m. this Wednesday, uh, October the 7th, to announce that we'll have a special business meeting to announce that we're going to vote on the bylaws change, Section 3, leadership, at the annual meeting. That's all I have for you right now. We look forward to seeing you October 7th at the special business meeting. Thank you. All right, good morning, Lexington Park Baptist Church. It is uh, time for preaching the Word of God. Today we have Chaplain Terry Hayes with us. He's going to be finishing up this sermon series, this three-part sermon series we've been doing on Stronger, Stronger in Christ, Stronger in Our Weakness, and now today, Stronger Together. So as we bring this together, we hope this sermon series has encouraged you and strengthened you in this time of need, and always remember we can do all things through Christ who is our strength. So let's hear it now for Chaplain Terry Hayes. Thank you, Chris. Before I begin our message this morning, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles for our scripture reading. Let's all turn together to Acts chapter 2, the beginning of the book of Acts, beginning in verse 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the, the blessed truth of the Word of God. Thank you that we have a living book, a talking book, who speaks to us of truths about the church, the great foundation of all of our faith. So open our hearts and minds to receive what the Holy Spirit would say through the Word of God through me this morning as we study it together. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I'd like to say, first of all, a very hearty thanks to Pastor Chris, Pastor Joe. They asked me a couple of weeks ago if I would be willing to speak, and for a retired Army chaplain who hasn't preached for a while, that was a great blessing. It filled my soul. My name is Terry Hayes. I'm, my wife is Susan. We've been here a part of Lexington Park Baptist for several months now. We moved back here with our son to be closer to his boys, a couple of grandchildren, and I was an Army chaplain for a long time originally from Oregon, and we're just happy to be here and especially happy to be able to share the word with you. When I graduated from seminary a long time ago, I had gone to Bible college for three years. I'd gone to seminary for four years. I'd probably had a church about the class, and I found myself in 1982 the pastor of the Clover Community Church in Hinckley, Minnesota. I remember very vividly sitting at a brand-new desk They had brought me a brand new chair, sitting in the basement of the Clover Church Parsonage. My books were on the shelf. I was 28 years old. We had a little baby, and I distinctly remember thinking, what do I do now? Because those dairy farmers were looking for a shepherd, and I had never been a shepherd. So we stayed for several years. In fact, the next year in 1983, I accidentally set the parsonage on fire. I spent a couple of weeks in the burn unit. We stayed at the church. It grew a little bit. Our family grew. We had three children. We had a nice new church. They built a brand new parsonage. So I've seen a thing or two in ministry. And through the years, I've noticed there's always been something called the next big thing. I remember back when it was evangelism explosion, getting all your people trained in EE. And then there were small groups. Are you connected to a small group? Are you leading a small group? And then there was discipleship. Our Bible college back in the day was heavily into discipleship. I'm being discipled by Roland Salter, someone told me. And I thought, how could I be discipled by Roland Salter? And then there was the emphasis on getting a Christian school, having a Christian education. And then there were missional churches. And then the language began to change in the church growth movement. And words came up, as Michael Horton out in California at Westminster Seminary mentioned words like radical, epic, revolutionary, transformative, emergent, alternative, life-changing, extreme, awesome, cutting edge, on the edge, a whole new level. But I'd like us to think this morning about the ordinary church, a basic church. I brought a prop. Chris was very excited to see my prop. It's a left-hand, right-hand football. And it reminds me of a story that's told, I'm not sure it's true or not, but it's a great sermon illustration, of Linson Lombardi, who was the head coach of the Green Bay Packers back in the 60s. In training camp in 1961, Vince Lombardi walked into the room with Bart Starr and Boyd Dowler and Jim Taylor and Paul Horning, all those famous legends. And he was tossing a football in the air, and Vince Lombardi said, gentlemen, this is a football. And he said, we're going back to the basics. So I'd like to do that today. What is a church? What is a basic, ordinary church? And the first thing I'd like to see, I see your three or four truths about the the local church. If you take your, your Bible and open it to Acts chapter 2 again, and we'll focus on verse 41. The first thing I'd like to mention, and we see in this text this morning, is that the church is a fellowship of believers. The church is a fellowship of believers. Look again at verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. So those that received his word, that is those who, were, who heard the gospel preaching of Peter and were saved, were baptized. Those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. The church is a fellowship of believers. They received the word, they were baptized, and they were added to the church. They were added that day about 3,000 souls. You don't attend church, you are the church. First of all, if you're a Christian, the church is not something you go to. The church is something that you are. 
You can't say, well, I'm not a human. I don't want to be a human. You are a human. If you're a Christian, if you say you're a Christian, the church is not something you go to. It's not some service that you attend. The church is you. It's what you are. Secondly, the church is God's idea. In Matthew 16, one of my favorite verses, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So if you get rid of the church, you're getting rid of most of the New Testament. The church is for and made up of believers. They didn't have a building. They recently discovered, just a few years ago, in a place in eastern Syria near the Iraqi border called Euro Europus, I believe, and it's a house that was converted into a church with all the frescoes. ISIS was trying to chip them off. And finally, Yale University, I think this part before ISIS, was able to get in and brought them to America. It was a church about 250 A.D. The early church had no building. So the church is made up of believers, and believers went to church. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a pastor in England a generation ago, once referred to a Welsh politician who said, I am a Christian, but I'm the non-church-going type. I am a Christian. I'm the kind that doesn't go to church, a C&E Christian, a once-a-year Christian. The New Testament knows nothing of a -a once-a-year Christian. They heard the word, they received the word, a term for salvation, They were baptized, and they were added. So the church is a fellowship of the redeemed. The New Testament knows nothing of a non-church-going Christian. In fact, it says in Ephesians 4 that he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and teachers, pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for what? For the work of the ministry. Hebrews says, let us consider how to stir one and up other to love and good deeds, not neglecting the assembling of ourselves together. So what is the church? The church is for Christians. The church is essential. In this day and age of the COVID-19 virus, some are saying the church is not essential. The church is essential for Christians because the, the church is the basis in which we love and worship God through Jesus Christ and seek to make him known to the world. One of my favorite verses this past year has been John 10, in which Jesus said, But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and they, I know them, and they follow me. So I think something that's been purchased with his blood, Acts 20, 28, and something of which Jesus said, The gates of hell will not prevail against it should be considered and essential service. About two years ago, I had one of the most remarkable experiences I think I've had in a long time. I was a hospice chaplain in Pueblo, Colorado, which is south of Colorado Springs. I was in a single wide trailer with a hospice patient who had dementia. In the mobile home was her daughter answering the phone for a restaurant in Burnsville, Minnesota, and another daughter. And she was very confused, but she indicated that she was a Christian. And she said when she was about 12 years old, she invited Christ to come into her life. And then she said something very interesting. She said, I don't know why I did that. And I'd just been looking at John chapter 10 and thinking about it, and I told her, I know why you did that. Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And something remarkable happened. It seemed for a moment as if her dementia left. Her eyes cleared. She leaned forward slightly, and she said, Yes, my sheep hear my voice. Why do I go to church? Why do Christians go to church? They're listening for the shepherd's voice. So that's the first very simple point, that the church is made up of Christians, It's a fellowship of believers. Now, notice the second thing in the book of Acts that Luke indicates is a characteristic of an ordinary church. It says in verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, perhaps your Bible says doctrine, and the fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Here's the second thing I see in this passage as to the characteristics of an ordinary church. It was a church that was devoted to the Bible. It was a church that was devoted to the Word of God. It wasn't just the right people, saved people. It had the right content. John Stott says that the Holy Spirit opened a school in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 new pupils in kindergarten. The apostles were the first teacher. And the curriculum was the teaching of the Word of God, the doctrine. Luke 24 perhaps gives us an indication of the, the curriculum, or this curriculum in the new church. Remember the two disciples that were walking along on the road to Emmaus. They met the resurrected Christ who drew near to him. They didn't recognize him. And it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I would have loved to hear that tape series or download series. That was a curriculum. The early church filled believers, not buildings. There was no building to fill. Fill believers. That's the mission of a church. Fill believers. Teach believers. Train believers. Buildings came later. There was a young pastor who came to Charles Spurgeon years ago, and he said, Mr. Spurgeon, I have a problem. He said, what's the problem? He said, my, my church is too small. And Spurgeon said a remarkable comment. He said, don't you think it's just big enough to give account for on the day of judgment? I know as a young pastor, as an army chaplain for a long time, well, I wanted people to come. Please come. Please come. Fill the pews. Fill the pews. The early church filled believers. There were no buildings to fill. So getting doctrine right. Getting the truth right. People say, well, I, I don't like doctrine. Doctrine divides. Doctrine's not good. We need to talk about our common essence and what we have in common. Getting doctrine right is the key to getting everything else right in life. Getting the truth of the Word of God right is the key to raising your children right. Getting doctrine right is the key to getting the pandemic right. Getting doctrine right, getting truth right, is the key to facing trials and cancer and raising children and enduring trials. It comes from knowing your Bible. Paul said to Timothy, another favorite verse in 1 Timothy 4, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. It's the same word in Acts 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. Devote yourself. Pay close attention. It can even be translated addiction. Addict yourself to Scripture. So the early church was a church that was devoted to the Word of God. Pay attention to it. Hold on to it. Give yourself to it. Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you continue in my what? My Word, you are my disciples indeed. Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. That's how a church grows. Doctrine matters. The hunger for the Word of God matters. Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law. It's my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, 97, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. So a godly man and a godly woman is a Bible lover. This church loved the Scriptures. They studied the Scriptures. They were addicted to the Scriptures. They loved the written Word. They hid the Word of God. They meditated on the Word of God. They delighted. This is all from Psalm 119. They delighted in the Word of God. They defended the Word of God. They preferred it above all others. They talked about it. They conformed to it. People say, well, that's just so divisive. You can't talk about doctrine. People are hurting. We, need, we don't need doctrine. And that's not what we find in the early church, is it? 3,000 students, 3,000 believers, 3,000 joined, the apostles teaching. They were all ears. The church is a believing church. It's a learning church. Consider the noble Bereans in Acts 17, 11. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. Someone said that a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone whose life 
isn't. It was a loving church. Thirdly, it was a loving church. Look again in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves. They were addicted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. And the fellowship. Our fellowship is with God. We go to church for God, to meet with God, to hear from God. But we also go to meet with each other. Just consider for a moment how frequently the Bible talks about the one another's in the bond of fellowship. Thirteen times, love one another, honor one another above yourselves, live in harmony with each other, build up one another, be like-minded towards one another, accept one another, admonish one another, greet one another, care for one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, be patient with one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Submit to one another. Look out to the interests of one another. Bear with one another. Teach one another. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. Exhort one another. Stimulate one another to love and good works. Show hospitality to one another. Employ the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of one another. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Pray for one another. Confess your faults to one another. Why do we do that? Because we're members of one another. How, how can a church like that not thrive? How can a church like that not grow? I used to use a lot of D.L. Moody illustrations, the famed American evangelist from the 19th century. He ran Sunday schools in Chicago I think the 1850s and 60s, and there's a famous story that of a little boy was running down the street in Chicago on a Sunday morning, and somebody asked, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to Mr. Moody's Sunday school. Why are you going there? There's a lot, there's another Sunday school closer. And he said, because they love a fellow there. They love a fellow there. And Moody later said, you show me a church where there is love, and I'll show you a church that has a power in the community. So they didn't go out and build a building. It's great to have a building. What a wonderful facility we have here at Lexington Park. They didn't go out and build a building. They loved each other. Luther's comment was um, true of often, I've often uh, obtained more knowledge in prayer than in many hours of study. They didn't just study, they prayed. And that's the final point this morning of this ordinary church. It was a church that was saved. The church is for Christians. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, when unbelievers come, and unbelievers do come to church, and unsaved people do sit in our pews, And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 that when they come and hear you speak in tongues, maybe it's with no interpretation, they'll say, you're crazy. But when they come and hear you prophesy, when unbelievers come and hear the word of God prophesied and taught and exhorted, they'll be saved. Unbelievers are welcome. The church is for the saved. It's a learning church. That's what I always look for. That's the first thing I look for. I don't look for music. I don't look for architecture. Programs is the word of God taught. It was a saved church. It was a learning church. It was a loving church. And the last point we'll mention this morning, it was a worshiping church. Notice verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. The breaking of bread and prayer. Not just prayer, the prayer. There was corporate prayer. There was corporate celebration of the ordinances. And sometimes you wonder, well, do we really worship like they used to in the olden days? I mean, should we go back to the first century? Do Baptists worship like that in 2020? And I came across an an article this week that described the basics of first century church worship post-New Testament era. 
And he said, first of all, worship in the ancient church was open to everyone. Everybody came. Sometimes people leaned in windows and listened. Sometimes they met in home. Sometimes they met in the temple courtyard. Sometimes they met in the open. Sometimes they met in the graves of departed loved ones. Perhaps some of you have been to London and and seen the catacombs. They went there not to hide from the Roman officials, but to be closer to grandpa and grandpa who had gone on to heaven. They gathered in homes. They gathered in, in the tombs of the departed. They gathered to listen to the preaching of the word. They gathered to listen to prophecy, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. They gathered to sing. What did they sing? They sang psalms. They gathered to read scripture. They gathered to give alms to the poor. They took an offering. They gathered to eat a meal, and with that meal was the, the agape, the love. Fist. So sometimes the more you read the, the New Testament, the better you feel about your church. That's what we do. That's an ordinary church. It may not be emergent or, or uh, all those other words that I read and can't remember. This is a beautiful cameo of what a church should be. A cameo. Remember, did your grandmother or your great-grandmother have a cameo? What's a cameo? It's a little image that kind of represents that, that person. This is the picture of what a church is. But it's very, very simple. It's wonderful to go to seminars, and I appreciate the seminar that the leaders went to recently. And I think a lot of modern church problems start right here. It's too easy to get away from the basics. It's too easy to forget the basics. Are you saved? Have you responded to the offer of salvation through Christ alone and received him? Have you been baptized? Have you been uh, joined into a church? That's the early church, the ordinary church. They were devoted to the word. They were a redeemed church. They were a learning church. They were a loving church. They were a worshiping church. And then it says, God did what? Look in your Bible, verse 47, praising God. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Is this you and your church? Are you a part of this fellowship? Would the church be a time you can check your vital sign? Just put your hand on your wrist. Check your life. Check your vital sign. Check your attitude. Check your desire to serve. Are these a part of your life? You know, every church will be stronger in one area than another. I think of all the army chapels that I pastored or the church I pastored. Every church has strengths and weaknesses, but we should not neglect any of these basic fundamentals. A saved church, a learning church, a loving church, a worship, worshiping church. It says they were a devoted, are you? Are you devoted to the church, the local church? And devoted means work. It means accountability. It means an, a willingness to overlook wrong, suffer. It, it means a desire to serve. And I believe if we follow this simple, cameo, basic description of an ordinary church, We'll see renewal come. We'll see growth come in our church. We'll see blessing come in the years ahead. So just an exhortation. Are you part of the church today because of faith in Jesus Christ? Or has God been a concept to you and not a reality? There's a big difference between God as a concept and God as a reality. Is he your savior? Have you confessed your sins before him and received the gift of eternal life through the substitution of every death of Jesus Christ. Are you a believer? If you're a Christian, you're the church. This is your church. And if you are saved and you're wondering, what can I do? How can I get involved? Think about the one another's. And maybe just indicate on that, that screen down below how the Lord is calling you to be a part of this church and to be involved and to be faithful and to serve. It was a saved church. It was a, it was a learning church. It was a loving church. And the church, and may our church as well, be a worshiping church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the beautiful cameo.
picture that Luke has pointed for us. This was the church that later in the book of Acts, Luke says, the men who turned the world upside down have come here. The men who turned the world upside down have come here. I pray that will be our experience as we follow just the basics. Back to the basics. Trust you, Lord, and you'll continue to grow and to bless this church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everyone, I'm glad you joined us for worship today. I hope you were blessed as we're going through this sermon series. We are stronger together, stronger in Christ, stronger in our weakness, and stronger together. So thank you again for joining us. Let's end in a blessing. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in Jesus' name. It's like a whole world to them because for the first time they have received this precious gift. Operation Christmas Child gives our church an opportunity to touch the world. It's a great adventure to evangelize. You've got an army of volunteers that pack the boxes. They're helping OCC to take the gospel literally to millions of children. This is the Good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. Getting people locally to think globally. What I love about OCC is that they are intentional about pouring into the lives of kids. They receive a box and also an invitation to come back and learn more about Christ. We just don't want to just hand out a box and stop there. We want them to grow in their faith. It's a great tool, an effective tool to reach communities with the gospel of Jesus. It's exciting to get people to heaven, but it's also exciting to get heaven to people. Thank you.